Yeah, what I want to do is talk about defense. And what it is, after 20 plus years being on offense, you know, I still like to be on offense. I do pen testing, gigs, consulting around the world and everything and stuff like that. But I wanted to start showing people there are things we can do to defend. And the main reason for that is I go into all these organizations, I do these tests, and I'm like, where's the fundamentals of defense? So we're going to cover some of the things you can do to defend. And it's funny because the committee and one of the things was they're like, well, some of the stuff you're talking about is, you know, it's been for a while. And it's true, but unfortunately, it's still not followed today. So we're going to discuss some of that because a lot of it, we all know there's no such thing as perfect security, right? Everybody's agrees, yeah? Okay, so I'm not going to get up here and tell you that, oh, yeah, we got a perfect security solution. We don't want a perfect security solution because we have that. We're all out of jobs on Monday. So we want to make sure that the hackers and all that type of stuff. What we want to do is make sure we understand defense. Okay, myths. We're going to talk about some myths, and one of them is going to be a well-known organization, and I was trying to see if any of them are here. I don't know. They might be. They can talk to me offline, and they don't like what I talk about. But what I'm going to tell you is they told you it was a sophisticated attack, and I'm going to tell you do the research. But it doesn't matter if the attack was sophisticated or not. The thing is, why was the data there in the first place? All right? I come from a military government background. 20 years ago, we were talking about a concept called segmentation isolation. Don't put any data anywhere without isolating it. If you can't isolate it, encrypt it. All right? So it was something we learned 20 years ago. So why just recently do we have all these attacks of data compromise, where people haven't used encryption and stuff like that? Talk about ingress and egress, inbound and outbound. And then the hardening concept. Most of us have heard the hardening concept, but why is it most organizations you go into don't have hardening guidelines? All right? They forget about the fact that every device, everything we have, almost all of them today, have scripts or something we can use to make them a more difficult target. So what I do when I go into clients, I tell them I'm going to emulate a medium level skill set and below. That is just an attacker that is not going to do reverse engineering and those types of things, and I'm going to show you what your risk is based on that. All right? If you do hardening and you do hardening guidelines, and we'll talk about some of that, it's very difficult to compromise you. All right? Then we're talking about the good and the bad, the fact that we know there's always going to be vulnerabilities. All right? And then memory analysis for when, if you do get compromised, some quick things you can do, a little quick methodology to look at that. And then we're going to talk about... We love to beat up on uh, Microsoft, and we love to beat up on Windows. But Server 28 and 12 has some really good security enhancements that makes it more difficult. Personally, I think it's because they finally brought in Mark Rosinovich, a Sys Internals fame, but they have some things in there that makes it more difficult to actually compromise them. And then we talked about bring your own device. We all talked about it already. We saw a lot of good demos yesterday where software is not a solution. So we're going to talk about some hardware-based solutions in there that are available even on the PC and the laptop side that some of you might know or might not know. And then finally, the, what I call the out-of-box network design. And that's based on running a network operations center for six years, giving the internet access to ships at sea, and then had everybody in the world trying to attack it. All right? So we're going to talk about that network design. So let's go ahead and get started. This is the one that drives me absolutely crazy. It was inevitable. They were just too good. Uh, anybody heard that before? Hackers are just too good. Uh, and then we have the buzzwords. APT. I see it everywhere, right? Oh, it's an advanced persistent threat. Sophisticated attackers. So I'm going to pick on that big organization. And unfortunately, you know, they don't like it, but it's true. EMC owns a group, the RSA. We all know RSA, Secure ID, the compromise against Secure ID, all those types of things. Well, EMC had somebody put a blog post out that said the compromise was inevitable. That's where this comes from, right? It was sophisticated, advanced persistent threat, and all these other types of stuff, right? Okay, those of you who've done research, you know more about it, was spear phishing, right? Target a specific area, send an actual attachment to PDF, and it says, uh, next year's pay scale, something like that. How many people are going to open that? Everybody. They want to know what they're going to get paid, okay? The problem was, and this is what I posted when I rebutted this blog post, I posted the fact that I don't care if it was a sophisticated attack. Let's talk about what it was. Secure ID, what is that? That's their number one market leader that they have to earn their revenue, number one. Number two, the source code for that, should it ever be on a public network? Anybody think it should be on a public network? Should I go put it in the cloud? Should I go put it in the cloud and just leave it there? All right, that's number two. Number three, what does RSA stand for? 
Ravesh, Shamir, Adelman, the three guys from MIT, well-known, you know, public key cryptography, all that type of stuff. Wait a minute now. It's on a public network. It's source code. And the prime function of these guys, RSA, is encryption. And the data is not encrypted. Can anybody tell me why the data is not encrypted? Do they not trust their own encryption? All right? And that's what I put in my rebuttal to that. Because it wasn't. It's a myth that all of these are sophisticated attacks. In fact, Kyle talked about it yesterday, the data breach report from Verizon, the 2011 versus the 2012, I got some numbers on that, all right? 96% of the attacks in 2011 were not difficult. 96% of the attacks, okay? 97% avoidable through simple security controls. Okay, this is the majority of what we're seeing out there. So unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, I was uh, at ISA, ISA uh, LA, not this year, but last year, and I was on a panel, and they asked me this question. Joe McCray, most of you know Joe McCray, he was the uh, moderator, and he, I'm mad to this day, he's like, why'd you ask me that question? He asked me the question, what do you think of the skills of Anonymous, right, the Anonymous Hacker Group, those types of things. Well, I'm thinking there as I'm getting ready to answer, okay, well, if I answer this as I say they're not very good, they're probably going to target me, right? So what do I do? What do I answer? So what I said is, we haven't tested them because of this. 97 and this 96%, the majority of these attacks are not that sophisticated and can be pre prevented with basic security controls. So let's put the controls in place and see how good they are, right? Let's challenge them. Challenge them. Don't be an you know, easy target. So that's what we looked at. 2011, 94% of the attacks were against servers. 2012, only 54%. Why? That's why. Mobile in 2012, 71%. And we've talked about that here at the con. You've seen everybody talking about everybody carrying their devices, right? And it's funny because no matter where you go, right, in the airport lounge the other day, everybody's sitting there like this. Everybody's got devices, right? And they're always going like this. It used to be everybody had the keypads, but the keypads kind of went away. So now everybody's always, you know, swiping their devices. So this is the key we've got now is the mobile devices. And that's why this number has changed. Now only 78% in 2012 was low difficulty. But still, that's a high number. We want to be on the other side of this 78%. We want to make sure we put security and defenses in place that will make it more difficult. Okay? Make yourself a harder target. Okay, ingress, inbound filtering. Now, some of these concepts have been around for a long time, but most everybody does ingress filtering. Yay, something that works. Everybody knows, oh, yeah, it's coming in, it's bad. Okay, good. So we got that. What's allowed in configuring your filters, of course, is your security policy. You're going to go through this pretty fast. But it's an easy one. No traffic arriving at the perimeter should have an internal source address, right? Sanity checking, basic stuff. But we get to the last point, we got an RFC that helps you on that. Anybody's read RFCs? Good for if you can't sleep. Right? Echo reply messages, the broadcast address. Again, those have been all used in attacks and their history, that type of stuff. The only thing I want you to do, though, is if you're in charge, you should know about ball gun filtering. If you're not in charge, go to your network perimeter team or your security or firewall team and ask them, do we ball gun filter? If they look at you like you're talking Klingon or something, you know you got a problem. Okay? Ball gun filtering is not new, but it's a concept we need to use today. Because what ball gun filtering, so you, those of you who don't know, is bogeys. What are bogey IP addresses I should never see? Okay? The, another parallel of that that a lot of people have problems with today, Windows by default, when you install it, puts IPv6 on there. Make sure you disable all your IPv6 traffic unless you're actually IPv6, because there's a lot of attacks already happening over IPv6. All right, and most of your monitors aren't looking at IPv6. So this ball gun filter is all part of that. Real life data. Malware infections. Went and did a survey. Went and one of the organizations had all these malware infections. 64% of the traffic would have been blocked by ball gun filtering. Okay? So again, it's mitigating the risk from all this internet traffic that we know we're going to have. We're going to have lots of it. And that's where we're going to come into the next part, because ingress, everybody does. Egress, most don't. Why? It's outbound. Right? What's our mentality when we've been training all these years? Oh, it's outbound. It's leaving us. It's good. Goodbye. Let it go. 
Okay? We have to change that outbound mentality. Why? Because most attacks use spoofed addressing. So if it comes to your outbound filter rule and it's got a spoofed address, it should never allow it out of your network. Okay? Those types of things. We also have a concept called black hole routing. This works very well. What that is is most of us on our client machine, we have an internal DNS server that we have to go to or a proxy before we can go out. All right? So in black hole filtering at your perimeter, you say if a source address comes and it's not of the proxy or that machine that allows traffic out, you just black hole it. Right? The null zero, the dev null, whatever you want to call it, interface on a router that prevents that traffic from going out. Okay? We use this very successfully in LAX. LAX gets a lot of traffic. You can imagine Los Angeles airports, I think there are what, seven terminals, that big giant international terminal. At the SOC, this is one of their biggest things they use to help protect them because black hole routing has been around for a while, but it works because most of this malware, when it gets on your system, does what? Phones home, right? Gets the data and sends it out. So all you do is you make sure it is smart enough to go find your proxy and then go out. If you have a good proxy, a lot of times it will drop the traffic too, right? And we'll talk here in a moment on the next slide of how you can set this up. And the challenge is, because I go meet with people all the time, and I tell them this. If you're not 24 hours a day, seven days a week, shut off the internet. Everybody freaks out. Oh, God, we can't shut the internet off. But you can from your internal machines, right? Think about it. Your internal machines, dude, they always need to be going out that live connection going out to the internet. In most cases, no. I mean, I agree, yeah, we love to have it on, but the days we live in today, that's changed as we'll look at some of the vulnerabilities coming up. Because of the vulnerabilities and things like that, we have to start thinking like this. Now, if you absolutely positively can't live without leaving your internal machines on because you want patches out and all this other type of stuff, start looking for well-known ports of communications at certain hours. Okay? It's easy to set up time-based access control in either the filters, you know, the routers, the firewalls. Time-based access control, HTTP, SSH, these are the well-known ones that malware love to use. What do you do? Drop it. Block it. Don't allow that out during certain hours. Now, I got into a little bit, not into it, but you know, I respect him a lot, Sean Baldwin. Some of you probably know him. He used to work for Dumbala. Wrote several books. He's very big playing a criminal and the Russian botnets and all that type of stuff. He's a security guy. And his concept was, well, the malware is always going to be able to get out because, you know, it's going to go out during strange hours and look like normal traffic, okay? Now, the challenge I got for him was most weekends are Friday, Saturday. But what about the Middle East? United Arab Emirates. The weekend is Friday, Saturday, right? Saturday, Sunday, U.S. What about Oman? Oman. Saudi Arabia, Thursday, Friday. Your malware is not that smart. Your malware is not going to know when a weekend is and not is, right? So when I set up Security Operations Center, the first one in Oman, the commercial SOC, we identified hundreds of malware infections just by identifying these ports that are well-known for malware communications in any outbound traffic. Because we knew the banks, right, they got a special weekend. Thursday, Friday is the regular everybody, and then Friday, Saturday is the banks, right? Why? Because everybody else in the GCC the Gulf countries is all Friday, Saturday. So the banks match that. But the commercial sector is Thursday, Friday. So we had all this traffic coming out of one of the banks that we're monitoring over there. So we drive over to the building trying to see if anybody's there. No, it's locked up tight. There's nobody there. So why is the traffic going out? Malware infections. We identified over 150 in one weekend through the SOC just by deploying this type of type. It's hard because people don't want to do it. They want, you know, what does everybody think? Oh, the internet's always got to be on, right? Home, at home, man, how many people ever turned their broadband off? Do you ever really just unplug your broadband? No, we just we want it on all the time, okay? So this is the concept. If you can't do it, subscribe to a service that looks for lookups of known malware sites, okay? The last part I'll talk about, there's a new one out there that's starting to do this, or you can actually set this type of thing up on your own doing shell scripts, PowerShell, stuff like that. Okay, web applications, have white hat here and that type of stuff. I don't have to explain to everybody how important it is to harden web applications. We saw that talk yesterday talking about code, right? Come from a programming background. All we ever did in the early 80s, all we wanted to do is make our code work and go home. 
Got tired of chasing semicolons at 3 o'clock in the morning with the C language, so we went and became software engineers and designers. But you need to harden these things as your web applications. Okay? What I like to do with clients, I did it with the United Nations. Put into your contract vehicle. If I get compromised by one of your web applications that I paid you to build, uh, you got two options. Joe McRae option is give me back 10% of the contract cost. All right? Another option is you just don't get paid for the contract. If you can't give me code that can't pass the basic testing guy from the OWASP, Open Web Application Security Project, then I'm not going to allow you to get paid for the contract. Okay? We did it for the United Nations six years later. They haven't really had many attacks after they were having a number of attacks because of the buggy code. So these are things you can think about. Okay, hardening systems we talked about. But what I want to talk about mainly is Microsoft. How many people use Security Compliance Manager? Okay, a couple of you. Everybody should. We finally got something from Microsoft, because we know NSA, Center for Internet Security, all these things have had all these cool stuff. We finally got something from Microsoft that gives us hardening and customization of systems. So if you go in here, you got Internet Explorer 8, 9, Office, Windows 7, sir, everything you can think of, there's entire baselines that will help you configure it in a more secure manner. All right, and I can tell you now, after spending a year going to pretty much everybody's advanced hacking courses and everyone they had, when I hardened to these guidelines, none of these attacks were working. So I actually went to all these different hacker contests and all this type of stuff, put in hardened systems, you don't pop them. Okay? Make yourself a harder target. Okay, so not that long ago, this was put out by first an Australian signals division. In SANS, the SANS Institute picked it up. Alan Pauler actually did presentations on it. They won a big award and all those types of things. But they called these the top four security controls that would block 85% of the attacks at the time. Okay? The only one on this list that's really new is what? Application whitelisting. But it works. If you haven't set up some form of application whitelisting, you should. Again, it's another deterrent. Okay? Different things you can do. The rest of them is pretty easy. Patch, patch, patch. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's broken. How about this one? Disable the local admin account on domain computers. A lot of people don't do this, but you should actually make sure that what? Local admin is not there. Remove it or disable it. So I'm on the machine. I pop the box to get a shell. There is no local admin account. Okay? So I have to go one step further. Again, make it a little bit more difficult on the attackers. Okay. So what SANS did, they took the Australian Signals Group, I think it was 32 controls, and they came up with the SANS critical security controls. All right? And number five is malware defenses. Again, understanding that these controls work. So start trying to deploy and implement them in your organization. That's what we want to do in our protections. We want to make sure that we start deploying these types of things to make ourselves a harder target. All right? Okay, good and bad. We've gotten better at security, right? Hackers gotten better at hacking. It's like an arms race. That's what I've always said for 20 years type of thing. Okay? This is the problem. Our patch system's broken. What is the second Tuesday of the month? Everybody knows Patch Tuesday. Yeah. Does that mean that that vulnerability just came out on Tuesday? Of course not. People in the know, there's people that know that, right? So what do we call Wednesday in the hacking world? Exploit Wednesday, because when Patch Tuesday comes out, I think the last one was, what, 15 or something critical, some crazy thing. But anyway, when it comes out, how many of you can patch within 24 hours? Most organizations, enterprises can't, all right? So where you go from a subset of a small group that the researchers and people who knew about this vulnerability, and then it goes out on Patch Tuesday, who knows about the vulnerability now? Everybody. So what do we do? The hackers start saying, yeah, we got all these exploits now because we got these new vulnerabilities, and they have like codathons. Anybody heard of exploit database, those types of things? Go there the next day after Patch Tuesday. Here they got all these really cool exploits ready to go. Okay? And as we said, most people don't get the patches rolled out. Maybe a week. All those days are exploit days for the hacking side. Okay? So this is how bad it gets. I like this site. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. Zero Day Initiative, yeah. So when I took this screenshot, we had a CVS Common Vulnerability Score and Severity System of 9.3. 
The highest is a 10. So that's a critical high vulnerability. And the vendor has known about it for 183 days. Anybody naive enough to think that just that security researcher here anyway is the only person that found that vulnerability? Okay. This is why our patch system's broken. But it's the best we have. Because remember, it was two of the top four controls was patch everything, right? And then everybody's favorite target, Adobe. Huh? Why? Everybody loves Adobe, right? Use something else. Don't use Adobe. There's other PDF readers. Right? Again, understand this is a high value target. It's a 7.5, so not as bad, but it's a 198 days old. Huh? Now, I love this part because anybody who knows zero day initiative comes from tipping point. Tipping point was actually purchased by HP. So HP is on the list. So it's like they put themselves on report all the time in their own list. So sometimes I wonder, does HP even know this list exists? Because it came from, you know, tipping point days. And so they got the most critical severity on their own, HP. It's a 10, and it's 422 days old. So they put themselves on report all the time. So, and there's two of them, 10s the most critical severity vulnerability we can have, and it's 422 days old. Anybody remember, it wasn't that long ago, probably three or four years, but Microsoft patched the vulnerability, it was four years old. Huh? They knew about it for four years. Okay? That's why the patch system, it's not gonna save us. We have to use it, you know, but it's not gonna save us. What saves you is ingress, egress filter into the perimeter to identify when you get compromised because there's always a chance this vulnerability is going to get you. Because are we ever going to get the users to stop clicking? Are they ever going to stop clicking? No. They're always going to click. Everybody says, oh, no, 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 everybody's getting smarter. No, it's not going to happen. Right? In England or places like that, they, whatever event's going on, World Cup, 200,000 infections because they sent out phishing email that said, hey, click here for the latest news of the World Cup. 200,000 machines infected that fast. Right? And now with the social network and everything, it's even got worse. Okay, memory analysis. So what do you do after you get compromised? You're like, oh, no, we're going to get compromised? Reality is if somebody targets you, they're going to get in. So segmentation and that isolation is put the actual machine in an area where it can't go anywhere else. Okay? I like to tell the story of in the Navy, I was a chief, and I'm working with the battle group setting up the actual accounts for the admiral. So I go into the admiral's cabin, right, and I'm in there. He's like, Chief, i got to talk to you about something. I'm like, oh, great, the admiral wants to talk to me. What the heck does he want to talk to me about? And he goes, I need an easy password for his computer. I'm like, well, sir, the requirements are this and this and this. And he's like, Chief, I'm an admiral. You're a chief. you got to do it you know, anyway, the Navy thing. Okay, collar device. My flip for it. My collar device is higher than yours, those types of things. So you know what he wanted? A four-digit password. And I'm like, can I tell him no? Well, I can, but what's going to happen? I'll probably still be a chief, but I probably will be in a lot of trouble as a chief, right? So, no, I can't tell him no. So what we do? We gave him a segment of his own, isolated him, gave him his services he needed, and he had his four-digit password. But nobody ever really, we worried about it because he was isolated. He could get his radio message traffic, which we delivered to him. He could get his little internet access, email, stuff like that. But he was out separate from the network, as I'll show towards the end, with a secure network architecture. These are the things you have to start thinking about is segmentation isolation. Because if the business needs there and it drives our revenue, we're going to do it. We're going to do it as far as the application, mission critical, whatever it is. So isolate it on your network. It's not a new concept, but people don't think that way. They just put everything in all together, right? Okay, so running processes. We've seen some of these tools yesterday, so I won't spend too much time on them. But the main thing to realize is when somebody gets on your machine and compromises it, you got to try to look at, okay, what happened, right? So you're doing your egress filtering. You've set up your egress filters we've talked about. You've identified a machine that is suspicious because there's traffic going out to the Internet. So you start looking at the memory. So the first thing you want to look for is... A list. This is PS list from Sys Internals, right? Different types of stuff like that. Because most malware, if it's not sophisticated, is going to rename itself as SVC host, service host. Everybody loves SVC host, all right? So when you look here, all these SVC hosts have lots of, you know, threads and handles and all that type of stuff. And then down here, we got an NC. Well, we've seen that yesterday, Netcat. So that's a Trojan. We got an SVC host here that looks kind of suspicious 
because it's down here. But looking at this list, you really don't know what's actually taking place or not. So this is a little bit better because PS list minus T gives you, this is what we call process antecedents. That is parent-child relationship. So now when you look at this, all these SVC hosts are children of services. What about this SVC host down here? Who's he a child of? He doesn't have a parent. Can we have a child without a parent? Well, let's not get into cloning and all that stuff, but yeah. Okay? So when we start looking, this SVC host says NA. It doesn't have all these services. This is task list, forward slash SVC. These are suspicious. And we start doing memory analysis with all these really cool tools. I mean, there's some great tools out there. Mandy, it's free. Redline, very good. A lot of other tools. The problem is there's lots of false positives. So you have to manually go in here and look at the information, right? And then we love Process Explorer. Because Process Explorer breaks it out and shows us NCs right here, SVC host right here, and the normal SVC host, say generic host process of Windows, and Microsoft Corporation. But down here, what's it say? Nothing. That's suspicious, right? These are types of things you have to do when you start doing memory analysis, once you identify somebody's been compromised. Okay? As I mentioned many times in the talks yesterday, if it's very sophisticated, you may never know what happened other than the fact that it's got internet connections trying to go out to the internet because your black hole filtering or something identified it. So what do you do? Maybe rebuild the box. Sometimes you just have to rebuild the box. Okay? Because sophisticated malware, none of that works. You have to look at the actual raw image in most cases. There's tools that do dynamic analysis and all those types of things. But if someone wants to talk about me, me offline, you can. Majority of the tools I've tested, there's a lot of false positives. It's much better to take the actual raw image and then analyze it with a tool like Memorize, uh, Volatility. There's a lot of different tools you can use, but most of the tools I've used live has a lot of false positives. And I just don't have time to go through. And, you know, I, I did one for a uh, very large uh, vendor in the Middle East, and I'd never seen nothing like it. Every damn machine we pulled up, server or whatever, Hundreds of processes that were all infected according to the tools. And I'm like, this is insane. So what did we do? We picked up and we started our egress filtering. So what we did it. We just shut the door for everybody one weekend. And we watched traffic coming to the perimeter. We found 150 malware infections that weekend. Again, there's a lot of environments out there that are infected because everybody is doing the online thing, right? So we have to look at it. So what I do is I look for hooks. That's the old traditional way of doing malware, hooking into the SSDT or the IDT, right? Different things like that. This one I made easy because I called it virus. Everybody should see that, right? So I train people with this. But what the important part is virus, when you go into the hooks of the system server, the SSDT descriptor table, you see here, hide EVR, you probably can't read it, but hide EVR2. That's actually a root kit. So that's actually a root kit that's a hooking root kit. Okay? which is more of your traditional root kits. Your DCOM, direct kernel object manipulations, won't have hooks. So you look for ports. If there's no ports, you got to walk and look at the DLLs because the dynamic link libraries, the loading of that, will usually identify what the malware is. But this is kind of where we're at today. Once you get compromised, sometimes you're just going to have to rebuild the box because the malware gets more and more sophisticated. All right. As was mentioned yesterday, when did the talk and showed sandboxy, the vulnerabilities there and everything, right? That's because the kernel, the way Windows implemented the kernel, is what we like to call broken. Only uses two of the four rings of the Intel architecture. Okay? I had slides on all of that, but I was worried about time, so I took it out. But for those of you that don't know, all user mode processes spend time in kernel mode. That was discussed yesterday. So what's in kernel mode? Uh, everything. So when we saw yesterday is he took over kernel mode. When you take over kernel mode, you tell the operating system or the applications what you want them to see. Okay? And that's, as he said, that's an architectural issue that probably Microsoft will never fix. Okay? So malware equals system, not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's a lot of money involved, right? Different things you could do. Let's see how I'm doing on time here. So help. Everybody agree we need help. Give Microsoft credit. I've bashed Microsoft for 20 plus years. You know, Landman hash, we love it. You know, that's the biggest joke in the world. We love it, all that type of stuff. But they've gotten better, right? They hired Mark Rosinovich, stuff like that. They actually, anybody who used Metasploit, 
the interpreter shell, the guy who wrote Escape. He's been at Microsoft now for quite a few years, trying to prevent his own tool. Okay? So Microsoft's been doing a lot of that. But they give us the Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, EMET. Now you've seen a lot of these attacks against data execution and all that type of stuff. So this tries to add obstacles to exploitation. It's not perfect, but it's great because they had a contest. The guy who compromised it last year at Black Hat DEF CON, within two days, they had the new update of EMET out. So it's not perfect, but I got a demo if I get time where I can show it. Harden those legacy applications. If you have to run Adobe, because you have you know, managers and people just love Adobe, put it into the EMET protection. Okay? It's very powerful to do. It blocks execution of a lot of these exploits. I'll talk about the end of what they're doing now. Adobe, I always put it in EMET because it's always going to have vulnerabilities. It's cross-platform. Everybody loves it. So we took 27 sample exploits, Dan Guido and his project, the exploit project. EMET mitigated 22 of the 27 easily. Just basically put it into the system. All but one was mitigated using a little bit of configuration. And the one we couldn't mitigate, Firefox. Okay? So again, you have to look at this in your organization and say, OK, there's no patch. If there's no patch available, do we use it or what? Just start looking for machines that have Firefox on them to have activity, network activity back and forth. I don't care how good the hacker is, when they get on the box, they have to get data out of the box, right? Or get it to another box. Start looking at those communication channels. We know we can't prevent the users from clicking. Okay, there's EMET, shows you some of the examples. See, XP 20, 2003, Vista 2008, right? All these types of things. All the protections, data execution prevention, right? Address space layout randomization, ASLR, all those types of things. They're available. It's free. Install it. Okay? See on your critical boxes. And this is what it looks like. So you go here is you're just running processes. You configure system here, you click configure application. And you just add applications into the EMET protection. And that's what I've done here. I've taken uh, Adobe, Excel, Firefox, iExplorer, Fairnet Explorer, MSN, Outlook, PowerPoint, WinWord, and added them all into EMET configuration. So this shows you all the protections that are available in EMET. Okay? So that's what we got down here now, and you're seeing that I've actually got Skype. I added Skype in there right here, and it protects from heap spray and all these other types of exploit opportunities. Okay? It's not perfect, but it makes and raises the bar of the attacker. As long as we're making it more difficult, we're reducing our threat vector. Who are we going to have our attack surface with? Okay? Server 2008, some of the protections. NAP, network access protection. Anybody used it yet? No. Okay. Anybody heard of network access control, NAC? Huh? Now Microsoft gives you a solution in Microsoft. You don't have to go out and buy that third-party product. Okay? Talk to me offline if you want, but I actually build a lot of... Uh, IPsec isolation, DHCP isolation using their NAP within 2008. I do it in my advanced network defense course I've written. A lot of cool things you can do there. PKI, we saw some of the problems with that yesterday. Because if the keys are stored in software, if I'm at kernel level, what can I do? Yeah, don't store it in software. Put it in hardware. Okay, Hardware-based protections, trusted platform modules, TPM, stuff like that. Read-only domain controllers. Anybody using this one? This is great. There's a lot of sites I can't isolate or I can't protect physically. And everybody knows if I physically touch a machine, I own the machine, right? So I can set up a read-only domain controller where I can't write to the actual Active Directory. So even though the box is compromised, there's no way to compromise actually the Active Directory. If you haven't used it before, I highly recommend you looking at it. Okay? And then we can do a lot of different software restrictions. Server 2012, anybody using it? Secure boot. Based Windows 8 was the first one to do it. This is hardware-based boot protection because of the boot block root kits and all the other cool stuff. What they do is they look at a hash of the kernel, the last known good kernel when it shut down. If it comes up and it doesn't match, it doesn't boot. Okay? So you might want to look at that. They actually even have DNS sec because DNS has always been an attack type of thing. And it's more secure and robust and easier than 2008, so it's getting better. And then this thing, in 2008, you have what's called a server core installation where you can install Windows without the GUI. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, server cores. That's really cool, but the problem in server 2008 is once you do that, you can never go grab the GUI, right? 
So what did they do? In 2012, you can load the GUI, use it, and then unload it. Okay? It's a little bit different. Personally, coming from a Unix world, new Unix way before anything else, I would rather never have the GUI. Okay? That's because I like to type everything on the command line, right? Get all my students come in, they all pull up ZenMap. I know ZenMap's cool and easy to use, but no, I'm a command line person. Okay? But now with 2012, you can actually load the GUI and unload it at your need. So that's pretty cool. And there's the actual secure boot architecture for Windows 8 and Server 2012. And it shows you how the sequence, everything's set up in the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module. So there actually is a secure boot sequence in the TPM. If you've never done it, it's actually pretty cool because we saw during the demonstration yesterday stealing of certificates and smart card credentials and all that type of stuff. Well, I do a similar type of attack with that, but if I do use a trusted platform module, a hardware-based cert, the attack fails because it goes and looks at the hash in hardware and says this doesn't match, doesn't give me the information or the data, okay? Now, we've got everybody doing bring your own device. Yeah? How many people are aware of this standard, 802.1AR? Some of you? This is actually secure device identity. This is set up to give us protection for our mobile devices. The problem is, where is it? It's been around since 2009. You give a device ID to a device, they're trying to do hardware based with trusted platform module and all this other type of stuff. We were promised 2012, uh, okay? We know the phone attacks are on the rise. If you have mobile device identity, it helps protect it. Again, it's another layer of protection. There's no perfect security. We know that, but we make it more difficult, okay? As I said, mobile trusted platform module, MTPM. We thought it would release in 2012. It didn't. Device identity, we already talked about. Apple, what's Apple always do? Nah, you guys do what you want. We're going to do our own. So they decided to go proprietary. So how good is it? Depends how good the proprietary solution is. Only thing I got to say about that, anybody remember the Landman hash? No peer review? How about WEP? Wired equivalent privacy, all that type of stuff. No peer review? So is there peer review on this? Proprietary? Only the people they pay. Right? So will you trust them? I don't know. Some people will. Okay. So I put this slide up because I would see 50 to 100 attacks an hour in the NOC. Something went on politically in the world because we were military government, all that type of stuff for you know, ships all in the region, uh, sea, and the North Atlantic Ocean. We would see that spike, 250, 300 attacks an hour. Anybody want to sit there and try to go through, anybody do analysis of uh, IDS logs and firewall logs, all that type of stuff? Yeah, about as excited as watching grass grow, right? Uh, okay, yeah. So what we did is we had to come up with a better way. So most people, right, you have your DMZ either here, we call it the public DMZ, or today with Security Plus, they like to do it off of here, separate services, subnet, you know, all kinds of crazy buzzwords, uh, belts and suspenders architecture. The thing is, though, when you do this, you have to allow all this traffic through your first layer of defense. So you've effectively null and voided your first layer of defense. So what's a better way to do it? Move it off to its own interface off of your main traffic. This does one of two things. One, any traffic in here now that has port 80, you know, all them cool ports, everybody loves to find web applications, all that cool stuff. Anything in here is malicious. It's kind of like a honeypot DMZ, a whole honey net. Why? Because no traffic should be in here. It should all be here. It's actually pretty easy to do. Also, all this traffic here is now off of your main traffic, and it increases your performance amazingly, much, much faster. Okay? So what we would do is we would put app servers there and IDS right here. Why? Because if any traffic destined to port 80 or 22 or all these other ports that are usually in the DMZ or the separate services subnet, those types of things, it was malicious. Okay? That was the only time I would have an actual indication alert page me and tell me, hey, I've got malicious traffic, all right? Those types of things. It's an amazing concept. It works so well because as soon as I got traffic around that I was concerned about, what do we do? We go into, as most intrusion analysts do, isolation mode. We say, okay, do we have any sessions? Are there any sessions with this traffic? Because sessions means 
Somebody probably had a zero day and actually compromised it, so I have a session, right? Those types of things. And then we started trying to isolate the leverage, level of knowledge of the attacker, right? We want to know the skill set, okay? So what we had was, is we had, if they were coming at us with Windows, nothing against Windows people, but 20 years ago especially, we put them in a low priority queue. No serious hacker would be coming at you with Windows, okay? These are all things we can do in our environments, okay? Segmentation, isolation. And what you do here is, you put your services here, like remember that Admiral? We called it his island, Admiral Island, yeah? You put your services in here, so if it gets compromised, it can't go this direction. It's totally untrusted, nothing can go this way, okay? Those of you configured firewalls before, you configure it for what we call absorb. You only absorb the packets, you don't respond. You make it much harder on the attackers, okay? Buying ports inside the Bastion host. The box here, the Bastion host, put all the ports you need for the internal network and bind it inside. All right, so we'll talk about a little bit of that. Smooth wall. Anybody use smooth wall? Nice free one. It's got a commercial one too. What I love about it is this is a default installation of smooth wall. This is inbound network traffic. All I did was install this box out of the ISO image. What's allowed? Uh, nothing. Why? Because it's inbound. Smoothwall knows nobody should be coming inbound unless you give them explicit permissions to come inbound. But if you use the secure network architecture, you don't have to give them anything. It's all in the other DMZ. So by attacking this box, there's nothing. Nothing's open. All 65,535 boards are closed, or 65,536 if you count zero. This is the types of things you have to start thinking about. Okay? I don't care how good the hacker is, if the box doesn't have a port open, I can't attack it unless somebody physically gets on it or clicks on something. Okay. Egress. By default, it binds all the ports your users typically need for the internal network to go out to the internet, right, remote access, all that type of stuff. They do that by default. So just by installing SmoothWall in a default configuration, you have solid ingress filtering and egress filtering that you can actually even make it more granular, but by default, it has this all set up already ready for you, ready to go. Okay, powerful things we can do. Okay, so we're not going to do the, yeah. What I want to show you is EMET. Okay, so if I go in here, how much time I got left? Okay, demo's uh, 10, so let's speed it up a little. Yeah, we'll do that, okay. What we're doing here is MS13009. So what I do is I take the latest and greatest vulnerabilities and I run them to see if I can exploit them by themselves flat because as I tell people I train in pen testing, if you can't get it on a flat network, you ain't never going to get it through a firewall or a filter, right? So what I do here with MS13009 is I got a interpreter shell and I'm going to keep getting the user to click a link because users are always going to click, right? So what I'm trying to do here is to exploit it. So as you see, it's sending the HTML. So those who do exploitation, is it 100%? No, that's why I didn't want to try live. Yeah. So we'll keep hitting it. Now it goes bang. Interpreter session open, spawn in the process to Notepad, migrate in it. Why? Because most people see Notepad, they're not going to kill Notepad. So therefore, our exploit still is going. And there it is, successfully migrated the process. Now this is brand new, use after free vulnerability in Internet Explorer. Okay? So what I like to do is, once I've tested it and seen I can do it, I'm going to try to mitigate it. Well, what was that tool I said we have help from Microsoft? EMET. Uh -huh. So let's speed up here and turn on EMET. And I'm dumping hashes and playing hacker, but that's all right. We've seen a lot of hackers. So there's EMET. So now I'm actually going to turn on EMET. And when I turn on EMET, We'll see if the attack works or doesn't work. Okay. So I just go in and I add, find the executable, and I just add it. IE, because IE's got the vulnerability. Now, I still got my sessions just to show you I added EMIT, but I still can interact with my session and hack the box and do all that type of stuff because it's after the fact. So we need to add EMIT in our 
hardening configuration guidelines, right? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is start my IE again and see if I can compromise it. So I'll CD because I'm just showing you extra stuff here. Just showing you where it's protected. There we go. There's my hash dump. See my URL? I keep hitting my URL. Send in HTML so it, it, it's got some stuff. But what's happening here? Emet is stopping it cold. So no matter what I try to do, try to play Hacker Joe and all that type of stuff, it continually, Emet continues to stop it. See that? Emet notifier right there. Emet notifier. And it continues to do it. It tries a heap spray, shuts it down. Okay? It tries a C hop, shuts it down. Tries that, shuts, it shuts all these exploitable options down just by, didn't take long. So what do you do? You go into those mission critical environments that you can't segment and isolate, and you put EMET on there, and you put these applications in there that your users want to run, that we really don't want to run, but we can't say no. Remember the Admiral, right? So since we can't say no, we have to run it. So it doesn't matter. I'll uh, stop the demo here in a minute and close down. But every time I try to get in there, it stops it cold. Okay? If you haven't used EMET, I highly recommend you download it and install it, and it really does work. Give Microsoft some credit. They got us something that works. They don't always do that. Okay. I think demo Windows Firewall I'm not going to do, but that actually is. Everybody knows InMap, right? Take InMap. Turn on the Windows Firewall. Run InMap with Fiodor's advanced scanning techniques, the actual, if you need the uh, command line, let me know, and see if it works. Stops it cold. Even in map, the most popular open source scanner cannot penetrate the latest version of the Windows Firewall. Give Microsoft credit. They've gotten better. Okay. Case study, 2012, right? 2012 Olympics. Pretty powerful, high profile event. You think hackers might want to attack it? We built an entire security operations center for the event. Had over 6,600 6, incident attempts, only six that ever made it to an escalation purposes, and never, none of them, were successful. Okay? So defense does work. We can do it. What about internal honeypots? There you go. Your malware, we know if it gets in, have internal honeypots. Any traffic to an internal honeypot? Dead giveaway, you've got malware in your environment. Okay? Breaking news from Microsoft, Black Hat, USA 2013. Contest to break EMET. They had it last year. Within two days, they had the new one out. But this year, they're going really, really high. You know what the prize is? 100,000 US dollars. So if you think you can sit down on their machine and break EMET, they'll pay you $100,000 if you can do it. That is a pretty good contest. And I'm done. So any questions? I think I have maybe a minute. Yes? Yep. Renaming. Well, the problem is most people know if you rename it, it's still, we love to call it the SID, but it's really the RID, the relative ID, is 500. So there's a lot of tools and stuff where I can still pull all the accounts with that 500 thing. So you can rename it. It's one step, but a hacker just has to know user to SID, SID to use some cool little tools from uh, Thor, Timothy Mullen, and then they can actually pull the data out. Yeah. But it is a deterrent. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? All right, I think I'm done. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. So on your critical boxes. And this is what it looks like. So you go here is, you're just running processes. You configure system here, you click configure application. And you just add applications into the EMET protection. And that's what I've done here. I've taken uh, Adobe, Excel, Firefox, iExplorer, for Internet Explorer, MSN, Outlook, PowerPoint, WinWord, and added them all into EMET configuration. So this shows you all the protections that are available in EMET. Okay? So that's what we got down here now, and you're seeing that. I've actually got Skype. I added Skype in there right here. 
and it protects from heap spray and all these other types of exploit opportunities. Right? It's not perfect, but it makes and raises the bar of the attacker. Long as we're making it more difficult, we're reducing our threat vector. Who are we going to have our attack surface with? Okay? Server 2008, some of the protections. NAP, network access protection. Anybody used it yet? No. Okay. Anybody heard of network access control? NAC? Huh? Now Microsoft gives you a solution in Microsoft. You don't have to go out and buy that third-party product. Okay? Talk to me offline if you want, but I actually build a lot of uh, IPsec isolation, DHCP isolation using their NAP within 2008. I do it in my advanced network defense course I've written. A lot of cool things you can do there. PKI, we saw some of the problems with that yesterday because if the keys are stored in software, if I'm at kernel level, what can I do? Yeah, don't store it in software. Put it in hardware, okay? Hardware-based protections, trusted platform modules, TPM, stuff like that. Read-only domain controllers. Anybody using this one? This is great. There's a lot of sites I can't isolate or I can't protect physically. And everybody knows if I physically touch a machine, I own the machine, right? So I can set up a read-only domain controller where I can't write to the actual Active Directory. So even though the box is compromised, there's no way to compromise actual the Active Directory. If you haven't used it before, I highly recommend you looking at it. Okay? And then we can do a lot of different software restrictions. Server 2012, anybody using it? Secure boot. Based Windows 8 was the first one to do it. This is hardware-based boot protection because of the boot block root kits and all the other cool stuff. What they do is they look at a hash of the kernel, the last known good kernel when it shut down. If it comes up and it doesn't match, it doesn't boot. Okay? So you might want to look at that. They actually even have DNS sec because DNS has always been an attack type of thing. And it's more secure and robust and easier than 2008. So it's getting better. And then this thing, in 2008, you have what's called a server core installation where you can install Windows without the GUI. Anybody ever done that? Yeah, server cores. That's really cool, but the problem in server 2008 is once you do that, you can never go grab the GUI, right? So what did they do? In 2012, you can load the GUI, use it, and then unload it, okay? It's a little bit different. Personally, coming from a Unix world, new Unix way before anything else, I would rather never have the GUI, okay? That's because I like to type everything on the command line, right? Get all my students come in, they all pull up ZenMap. I know ZenMap's cool and easy to use, but now I'm a command line person. Okay? But now with 2012, you can actually load the GUI and unload it at your need. So that's pretty cool. And there's the actual secure boot architecture for Windows 8 and Server 2012. And it shows you how the sequence, everything's set up in the TPM, the Trusted Platform Module. So there actually is a secure boot sequence in the TPM. If you've never done it, it's actually pretty cool because we saw during the demonstration yesterday stealing of certificates and smart card credentials and all that type of stuff. Well, I do a similar type of attack with that, but if I do use a trusted platform module, a hardware-based cert, the attack fails because it goes and looks at the hash in hardware and says this doesn't match, doesn't give me the information or the data. Okay? Now, we've got everybody doing bring your own device. Yeah? How many people are aware of this standard, 802.1AR? Some of you? This is actually secure device identity. This is set up to give us protection for our mobile devices. The problem is, where is it? It's been around since 2009. You give a device ID to a device, they're trying to do hardware-based with trusted platform module and all this other type of stuff. We were promised 2012, uh, okay? We know the phone attacks are on the rise. If you have mobile device identity, it helps protect it. Again, it's another layer of protection. There's no perfect security. We know that, but we make it more difficult, okay? As I said, mobile trusted platform module, MTPM. We thought it would release in 2012. It didn't. Device identity, we already talked about. Apple, what's Apple always do? Nah, you guys do what you want. We're going to do our own. So they decided to go proprietary. So how good is it? Depends how good the proprietary solution is. Only thing I got to say about that, anybody remember the Landman hash? No peer review? How about WEP? Wired equivalent privacy, all that type of stuff. No peer review? So is there peer review on this? Proprietary? Only the people they pay. Right? So will you trust them? I don't know. Some people will. OK. So I put this slide up because I would see 50 to 100 attacks an hour in the NOC. 
something went on politically in the world because we were military government, all that type of stuff for you know, ships all in the Norwegian uh, Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean, we would see that spike, 250, 300 attacks an hour. Anybody want to sit there and try to go through, anybody do analysis of uh, IDS logs and firewall logs, all that type of stuff? Yeah, about as excited as watching grass grow, right? Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. So what we did is we had to come up with a better way. So most people, right, you have your DMZ either here, we call it the public DMZ, or today with Security Plus, they like to do it off of here, separate services, subnet, you know, all kinds of crazy buzzwords, uh, belts and suspenders architecture. The thing is, though, when you do this, you have to allow all this traffic through your first layer of defense. So you've effectively null and voided your first layer of defense. So what's a better way to do it? Move it off to its own interface off of your main traffic. This does one of two things. One, any traffic in here now that has port 80, you know, all them cool ports, everybody loves to find web applications, all that cool stuff. Anything in here is malicious. It's kind of like a honeypot DMZ, whole honey net. Why? Because no traffic should be in here. It should all be here. It's actually pretty easy to do. Also, all this traffic here is now off of your main traffic, and it increases your performance amazingly, much, much faster. Right? So what we would do is we would put app servers there and IDS right here. Why? Because if any traffic destined to port 80 or 22 or all these other ports that are usually in the DMZ or the separate services subnet, those types of things, it was malicious. Okay? That was the only time I would have an actual indication alert page me and tell me, hey, I've got malicious traffic, all right? Those types of things. It's an amazing concept. It works so well because as soon as I got traffic around that I was concerned about, what do we do? We go into, as most intrusion analysts do, isolation mode. We say, okay, do we have any sessions? Are there any sessions with this traffic? Because sessions means somebody probably had a zero day and actually compromised it, so I have a session. Right? Those types of things. And then we started trying to isolate the leverage, level of knowledge of the attacker. Right? We want to know the skill set. Okay? So what we had was, is we had, if they were coming at us with Windows, nothing against Windows people, but 20 years ago especially, we put them in a low priority queue. No serious hacker would be coming at you with Windows. Okay? These are all things we can do in our environments. Okay. Segmentation, isolation. And what you do here is, you put your services here, like remember that Admiral? We called it his island, Admiral Island, yeah? You put your services in here, so if it gets compromised, it can't go this direction. It's totally untrusted, nothing can go this way, okay? Those of you configure firewalls before, you configure it for what we call absorb. You only absorb the packets, you don't respond. You make it much harder on the attackers, okay? Buying ports inside the Bastion host. The box here, the Bastion host, put all the ports you need for the internal network and bind it inside. Right? So we'll talk about a little bit of that. Smooth wall. Anybody use smooth wall? Nice free one. It's got a commercial one too. What I love about it is this is a default installation of smooth wall. This is inbound network traffic. All I did was install this box out of the ISO image. What's allowed? Uh, nothing. Why? Because it's inbound. Smoothwall knows nobody should be coming inbound unless you give them explicit permissions to come inbound. But if you use the secure network architecture, you don't have to give them anything. It's all in the other DMZ. So by attacking this box, there's nothing. Nothing's open. All 65,535 boards are closed, or 65,536 if you count zero. This are the types of things you have to start thinking about. Okay? I don't care how good the hacker is. If the box doesn't have a port open, I can't attack it unless somebody physically gets on it or clicks on something. Okay. Egress. By default, it binds all the ports your users typically need for the internal network to go out to the internet, right, remote access, all that type of stuff. They do that by default. So just by installing SmoothWall in a default configuration, you have solid ingress filtering and egress filtering that you can actually even make it more granular, but by default, it has this all set up already ready for you, ready to go. Okay, powerful things we can do. Okay, so we're not gonna do the, yeah. What I wanna show you is EMET, okay? So if I go in here, how's time I got left? 
Okay. Demos uh, 10. So let's speed it up a little. Yeah, we'll do that. Okay. What we're doing here is MS13009. So what I do is I take the latest and greatest vulnerabilities and I run them to see if I can exploit them by themselves flat. Because as I tell people I train in pen testing, if you can't get it on a flat network, you ain't never going to get it through a firewall or a filter. All right? So what I do here with MS13009 is I got a interpreter shell and I'm going to keep getting the user to click a link because users are always going to click. All right? So what I'm trying to do here is to exploit it. So as you see, it's sending the HTML. So those who do exploitation, is it 100%? No, that's why I didn't want to try live. Yeah. So we'll keep hitting it. Now it goes bang. Interpreter session open, spawning the process to Notepad, migrating it. Why? Because most people see Notepad. They're not going to kill Notepad. So therefore, our exploit still is going. And there it is. Successfully migrated the process. Now, this is brand new, use after free vulnerability in Internet Explorer. Okay? So what I like to do is, once I've tested it and seen I can do it, I'm going to try to mitigate it. Well, what was that tool I said we have help from Microsoft? EMET. Uh -huh. So let's speed up here and turn on EMET. And I'm dumping hashes and playing hacker, but that's all right. We've seen a lot of hackers. So there's EMET. So now I'm actually going to turn on EMET. And when I turn on EMET, we'll see if the attack works or doesn't work. All right. So I just go in and I add, find the executable, and I just add it. IE, because IE's got the vulnerability. Now, I still got my sessions just to show you I added EMIT, but I still can interact with my session and hack the box and do all that type of stuff because it's after the fact. So we need to add EMIT in our hardening configuration guidelines, right? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is start my IE again and see if I can compromise it. So I'll CD, because I'm just showing you extra stuff here. Just showing you where it's protected. There we go. There's my hash dump. See my URL? I keep hitting my URL. Send an HTML so it, it, it's got some stuff. But what's happening here? EMET is stopping it cold. So no matter what I try to do, try to play Hacker Joe and all that type of stuff, it continually, EMET continues to stop it. See that? EMET notifier right there. EMET notifier. And it continues to do it. It tries a heap spray, shuts it down. Okay? It tries a C hop, shuts it down. It tries that, shuts, it shuts all these exploitable options down just by, didn't take long. So what do you do? You go into those mission critical environments that you can't segment and isolate, and you put EMET on there, and you put these applications in there that your users want to run, that we really don't want to run, but we can't say no. Remember the Admiral, right? So since we can't say no, we have to run it. So it doesn't matter. I'll uh, stop the demo here in a minute and close down. But every time I try to get in there, it stops it cold. Okay. If you haven't used EMET, I highly recommend you download it and install it, and it really does work. Give Microsoft some credit. They got us something that works. They don't always do that. Okay. I think demo Windows Firewall, I'm not going to do, but that actually is. Everybody knows InMap, right? Take InMap. Turn on the Windows Firewall. Run InMap with Fiodor's advanced scanning techniques. The actual, if you need the uh, command line, let me know, and see if it works. Stops it cold. Even in map, the most popular open source scanner cannot penetrate the latest version of the Windows firewall. Give Microsoft credit. They've gotten better. Okay. Case study, 2012, right? 2012 Olympics. Pretty powerful, high profile event. You think hackers might want to attack it? We built an entire security operations center for the event. Had over 6,600 6, incident attempts, only six that ever made it to an escalation purposes, and never, none of them, 
we're successful. Okay? So defense does work. We can do it. What about internal honeypots? There you go. Your malware, we know if it gets in, have internal honeypots. Any traffic to an internal honeypot? Dead giveaway, you've got malware in your environment. Okay? Breaking news from Microsoft, Black Hat, USA 2013. Contest to break EMET. They had it last year. Within two days, they had the new one out. But this year, they're going really, really high. You know what the prize is? 100,000 US dollars. So if you think you can sit down on their machine and break EMET, they'll pay you $100,000 if you can do it. That is a pretty good contest. And I'm done. So any questions? I think I have maybe a minute. Yes? Yep. Renaming. Well, the problem is most people know if you rename it, it's still, we love to call it the SID, but it's really the RID, the relative ID, is 500. So there's a lot of tools and stuff where I can still pull all the accounts with that 500 thing. So you can rename it. It's one step, but a hacker just has to know user to SID, SID to use some cool little tools from uh, Thor, Timothy Mullen, and then they can actually pull the data out. But it is a deterrent. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? All right, I think I'm done. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Kevin.